Okay, before we even begin talking about the reverie, here's some of my thoughts from Fishman Island. Reverie. A state of being pleasantly lost in one's thoughts. A daydream. A fanciful or impractical idea or theory. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's sad. That's kind, of, that's kind of resonant to the story. So either one, the reverie is Arahime's dream being brought into reality. That's the good ending. Or two, these dreams are going to get crushed and nothing will be fixed or made worse, which is the bad ending. But I think historically, the more realistic one. Okay, so I mention all of this because it kind of happened and also kind of didn't happen, right? There's a lot of bad events at the Reverie, but also we don't really know anything yet because we kind of ended off on a cliffhanger. Not even a cliffhanger, it just ends. I thought I had skipped a few chapters or something, so I went back and reread it and I was like, nope, I'm pretty sure that it just ends here. And I read three more chapters ahead and still, nope, still no reverie. We just move on, I think, to the next arc. So I'm going to assume that we'll find out more about it later, but instead I'm going to react how you might have reacted. Okay, so at the heart of the reverie is Fishman Island, right? The residents of Fishman Island were accompanied by Garp, which I guess it makes sense. Garp is Luffy's grandfather, and he's like one of the only people that the audience can actually trust in the Marines. Though I think Fujitora, at least for me, takes the personal number one spot at the moment. Because uh, as it turns out, yeah, Fujitora is also here. Turns out everyone is here, actually, because the reverie is just a list of every single side character. We see a lot of them at the start of this arc when Luffy got his bounty. We see Kuraha and Vivi and Violet and Rebecca. We even see Punch King and the rest of the Dressrosa cast. Like, practically every character from the past arcs are right here. I love this idea of seeing all of the important characters that we've met along the way gather up here at the Reverie where, ideally, all of the big changes are going to happen. And just the way that it's being handled and how we stopped looking into the Reverie and moved on, I get the feeling that Marijua is going to be the endgame of the story just because it is so incredibly high-packed with characters. Like, someone who wasn't even on my list was Kobe, who went up the ranks and is now wearing a coat, and we see him stopping a bunch of pirates from kidnapping a princess that was going to the reverie. But I don't know, I was happy to see Kobe because it made me realize that we hadn't seen Kobe in such a long time. Like, there are so many characters at the reverie who we haven't dedicated time to in so long. Even Vivi's getting excited to be on the ship again, and it made me realize that, yeah, if we're finally gonna see all of these side characters who we haven't seen in such a long time get a very prominent role in the story. In this arc, we even get to see the Revolutionary Army attempt to head into the Reverie to retrieve Kuma, because Kuma's still a plotline that we've just had in the background, and we still know almost nothing. Like, what is Kuma doing here? It has to be like some kind of 4D chess move, but the play is just so out there that it has to be such an aggressive maneuver against the world government in some shape or form, but I don't know what Kuma is trying to do. Like, why would Kuma need to be a part of it? Why did he become a warlord to do it? Was it maybe to get close to Vegapunk? But then why specifically Kuma? I don't know. Like, Kuma is such a weird pawn in this. And then we don't just leave him there. We connect him to Bonnie. And again, like, what is Bonnie doing here? Did she sneak into Marijua? And again, like, why is everyone at Marijua? Like, what is her plan? She's been running around the New World for, I think, the past two years, right? Ever since the time skip. And she has lost her entire crew. Does she have beef with Kuma? Because Kuma did that paw push move that he did with Luffy and the crew. Or was it even worse? While we're talking about the Revolutionary Army, I think that there are some elements in this arc that'll affect the message of the story, and I want to kind of talk about it. Conceptually, I think you pay taxes to the world government and kingdoms join forces with such government under the idea that allying with the world government will provide some kind of protection. The world government's job in response is to protect the kingdoms that it is allied with, except uh, throughout the story, we have seen that to not be the case. 
We get a scene in this arc where Pinkbeard, an underling of Blackbeard, is freely pillaging, and the kingdom who is under attack gets no help from the world government. Uh, that has been a thing that has been occurring multiple times in other arcs. And with a government just unable to help the people, we get a very interesting side character in the role of Bello Betty, who I think carries a lot of the strong themes. Like her stance is very distinct and her devil fruit ability is literally to empower the people, which I think is just incredibly on brand for the Revolutionary Army. So I think the Revolutionary Army is at the reverie to completely destroy the existing government. It is a hyper-aggressive play, but I think it's going to be a lot like a whole cake island situation where everyone's gathered around, no one's expecting anything, everyone's talking about politics, and then BAM! The Revolutionary Army just pops in. We already have a ton of characters who have snuck into Marijua, like Sabo and the Mole Digger person. And in the process of going into Marijua, I kind of realized that the red line is structured like a castle wall, and so we're kind of creating this idea of invading the castle, with the red line having these castle-like pillars at the edges of its walls. There's also a lot of statues of what I think are previous celestial dragons. I love that we're having this world-building moment. We have seen the red line already carved with uh, statues and pillars. We see some of them in Reverse Mountain. And we also recontextualize Marijua to Mary Joes. Translation stuff happens like this sometimes. With added context, we need to restructure the naming of something. The name Mary Joes implies that it's named after someone, unlike Marijua. And I don't know or really think that the name will matter too much, but I'm not opposed to the idea of it. Alright, so in checking my notes for this video, I realized that one, there are just so many things happening in Marijua, that two, I think it was a good idea to establish Fishman, to some degree, as the focal point of the reverie. We hardly know any other political changes that might occur at the reverie, but we know one of them. The one that Odahime went to Marijua for. And considering the very scary history of Fishman in Sabaori, we already have a lot of stakes in this, and I think it helps frame the Fishman and Shirohoshi specifically as the protagonist of this arc. I think it's a good idea to see things from her perspective, since she is both very helpful and a newcomer to land in general. On her way up to Marijua, we get some gorgeous shots of the ocean as we just ascend to the top of the red line. And the entire scene, I think, is further impacted by Fishman's thematic connection to the sun. For as much as I like Vivi, I don't think this would have worked nearly as well if we saw her reaction as opposed to Shirohoshi's. We also get a secondary second point to the reverie, which is the Straw Hats. While the Straw Hats aren't at the reverie, all previous characters from the past arcs are all talking about the Straw Hats. Like anytime we zoom in on the reverie, we hear someone talking about the Straw Hats. And so I think it's very interesting to see the cast balance this tightrope in which they all act. Whenever anyone talks about the Straw Hats, we have to make sure not to frame them in an overly positive light as to raise too much suspicion. But we also have to be very careful because the Reverie is a tight balancing act where a lot of the powerful people are. We have uh, Steli here, which, ew. But we also have different kingdoms around the world that we have never seen before. We have references to, I think, real life locations. Like, I'm pretty sure this guy is just British. We have Vivi and Dalton and Kuraha all see Wapol again, who I didn't even expect to be relevant. And navigating this reaction is also a bit of a tightrope. Seeing Shirohoshi saying something as simple as yes or no to someone can start a war here, and I think it's neat to see Shirohoshi struggling to react to this. She is over flooded with people coming to see her, both people who adore her and hate her, without even knowing anything about her. This arc is not very subtle in a lot of ways. The vertical escalator, I think, is the pinnacle example of that, where uh, the vertical escalator takes people to Marijua, and we see all of the good characters, all of the fishmen, reject walking on this path and instead go on the path less traveled. I think this has some messages of unnecessary access, humility, characters with different priorities, but also just showing us the dehumanization underneath the escalator, which is so on the nose. That's not very subtle. And yet somehow it still feels like we get even less subtle. 
There is a sharp contrast in the way royalty acts at the reverie and how celestial dragons act at the reverie. We see Charlos want to kidnap Shirohoshi, and you would think that kingdoms valuable enough to meet in Marijua would have some kind of protection? In the land of offend no one in fear of creating a world war, it is a fitting contrast to the nobles to not even live up to those expectations. And it helps to showcase that fishmen are still not past this point of freedom by being targeted specifically. I find it interesting that, as far as I can see, there's no long arms or long legs or Skypeans or giants who are being represented at the reverie. At the entire reverie, there's like one giant and he's a marine and he doesn't count. The closest thing to a giant is Poseidon and he's a fishman and he's the only fishman. It is a very hyper-specific group of people that can be a part of the reverie. Like, there's not even any minx at the reverie either. And yeah, no wonder why. This went really bad, really fast. It was so bad that King Neptune was willing to burn this all down and just make a run for it. I think it's an important thing to note that the only reason why a celestial dragon didn't get their way was because another celestial dragon stopped it. As for a bit of a side note, uh, Rob Lucci is also at the Reverie. Like, he's he's here. I don't think I understand Rob Lucci's philosophy. Like, I don't know why he acts the way that he does. Rob Lucci and CP0 mentioned that they have saved a number of nations, which I guess is kind of true. And to some degree, Rob Lucci follows the rules set out by the Celestial Dragons. He even replies saying that Celestial Dragons don't follow any logic. What they say is right. And it made me realize that I don't really have a good grasp on what drives Rob Lucci. Does Rob Lucci view himself as someone who is just? When he was in NS Lobby, he was a heartless killer, but the way he presents himself is very interesting because he didn't choose to become a pirate. Despite being capable of killing and being a very powerful person, he specifically chose to be a CP0 member. It is a hyper specific way of understanding the world. All right, let's talk about some of the secrets in Marijua. Doflamingo has been an impel down just knowing one of the most important secrets, which I think is the fact that hidden deep within Marijua, I think, there is a, possibly a set of doors or maybe just one which contain a giant straw hat. Do all the other doors showcase other hats? Is there possibly a cowboy hat, a, a pirate hat? One is the uh, stereotypical kid hat with a spinning fan on top. Is there just a regular straw hat that someone, maybe Roger, maybe someone before him, stole? Or maybe there's just the one giant straw hat, which is still weird. Like, it is so out of left field that it kind of forces me to rethink a lot of the story. Like, the straw hat had always held value. It was always an important motif. It had uh, even more value after Fishman Island when it was deemed the hero's hat. It had all the Shanks and Roger lore up to that point. But that was all subtext. At this point, this is just plain text. It's weird seeing Emu looking at this giant straw hat and then looking down at Straw Hat Luffy and being like, Ah, hat. Like, what do you, what do you mean, hat? Are you just going to target everyone with a straw hat? It is framed as a dangerous, bad thing. So why is it kept here? Why isn't it destroyed? The world government has seemingly a very dark history with straw hats. Does it have something to do with those weird spirals that are framed in this shot? You know how I feel about spirals. Especially when they're contrasted with these other clouds, like spirals have a motif in One Piece, right? They are very prevalent in Devil Fruits. But at this point, I think that it's mostly just emphasizing the otherworldliness of it all. Because, you know, uh, it's a big straw hat, and that's weird. And if I, too, were a bad guy and seeing this kid with also a straw hat, it would give me major antagonist energy. So at the Reverie, we learn that Big Mom is gearing up for round two, this time teaming up with Kaido. I think it makes sense. Big Mom still needs to come back and have an actual fight. Half the crew is gone last time around. While One Piece as a series has normally been structured in more or less self-contained sagas, 
the new world has been structured almost as if every saga was an arc and this entire section of the new world was leading up to Kaido to be the actual saga. All right, I think it is time that we talk about the empty throne, right? In Marijua, we get to see a giant empty throne, and the empty throne symbolically represents the fact that everyone willingly chooses not to sit on the throne so that everyone is on equal standing with each other and no one is at the top. This sounds nice, especially with all the world leaders. It kind of creates the entire premise of the reverie, which, you know, I guess that sounds nice. But before we even saw Emu, we already had a bunch of contradictory information. We had the Celestial Dragons, which no one dares to go up against, which is already proving to be of higher status than everyone else. And now we are introduced to Emu, who's a character that's come out of nowhere, and Emu is dressed in this, like, really edgy outfit. Emu is seemingly against Shirahoshi, and Blackbeard, and Luffy, and even Vivi? We know the world government's been fearing the will of D, so I guess it makes sense that Emu would be cautious of Luffy and Blackbeard, maybe even Shirahoshi, since she is an ancient weapon. But why Vivi? Maybe it's because Crocodile thought that Pluton might be an Alabasta, so maybe Emu does too. The Reverie was suggesting that all of the kingdoms totally joined together and definitely made all of the choices all on their own. But now we get Emu, who is actually sitting on the Empty Throne and has the five elders bowing down to him and is acting as the most I am the bad guy character of all time. All right, while we're talking about just weird, sketchy stuff, uh, let's talk about Shanks. Like, why is he here? Why is he meeting the Five Elders so casually? How much does Shanks know of this world? Does Shanks know about Emu? Shanks so far has been the negotiator between the pirate and marine worlds, and we saw that back in Marineford, he had very deep ties to Sengoku. And at the reverie, Shanks goes up to the five elders and starts talking about this pirate that you might need to know about. And here's the thing, right? It is so vague. Like, is he talking about Blackbeard or Luffy? Is it a good or a bad thing? Is he talking about Kaido? Kaido's been saying that he's been waiting for a global war to break out. I don't know. Again, we almost have no information to work with. All I gotta say is that, hey, Shanks, it's pretty weird that you're casually hanging out with some of the most powerful people. And lastly, let's talk about the Great Cleansing. That, uh, that thing that really just, really just sounds like genocide. Like, like, we already had the Buster Call, but this sounds like the Buster Call, but more, you know? Are the Marines gonna go on an all-out attack on every island? Maybe cleansing? Like, at its best, maybe cleansing means getting rid of all of the pirates. But I don't know, world government, kind of fishy, kind of on brand for it to be fishy. I think one of the only problems with the Reverie is that it's an arc designed to build stuff up. We have Sanji with a Power Ranger can and Nami with a cloud power up. We know that Kaido crushed half of Kid and Apu's team and spared the other half. We build up to future arcs with a whole cleansing and emu thing. We're building up to a future arc with Big Mom and Kaido teaming up. But we also leave on a cliffhanger. Not even a cliffhanger. It just ends. Because, well, we dropped the arc. The reverie doesn't actually end. It was just starting. And it just cuts off. And I think we're moving on to Wano. So all of the buildup that we had from Fishman Island doesn't get resolved here. And anything I predicted or anything that anyone might have predicted just did not happen here. And I don't know, like on the one hand, it's a bit painful, but on the other hand, I believe that we're now moving on to Wano and then we're going to do something really strong with the Reverie, either halfway through or at the end. Anyways, thanks to all my patrons who are stuck on a huge, big uh, political discussion that has lasted several, several days and is getting extremely intensive over whether fish are people. What do you think? Are fish people? Are fish real?